Good morning um, and welcome. I would like to uh, call the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, U.S. Postal Service and Labor Policy to order. Uh, today our hearing is entitled, Where Have All the Letters Gone? The Mailing Industry and Its Future. Uh, I will begin by reading our mission statement, as we do in the uh, full committee and subcommittees of the uh, Oversight Committee. We exist to, to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with Citizens Watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I will now um, uh, start with my opening statement and then um, I'll recognize the, um, uh, the ranking member for his. Uh, the demand for profitable first class mail continues to decline. Due to deep economic recession and the ever, ever increasing reach of the Internet and new digital media, today's hearing presents an opportunity for lawmakers to hear important testimony from the mailing industry, which has been left reeling in recent years by these developments. It is an industry whose very survival depends on a strong and profitable United States Postal Service. The economic scope of the mailing industry and its impact on the United States economy cannot be overstated. According to industry sources, the mailing industry represents over 6 percent of the Nation's jobs and over 7 percent of the Nation's GDP. The industry touches virtually every private and public sector of the economy accounting for approximately 8.7 million jobs and generating $1.1 trillion in economic activity in 2009, according to a 2010 jobs report sponsored by the Envelope Manufacturers Association Foundation. Unfortunately, these numbers are down from recent years. As the recession and electronic diversion have eaten away at the mail volume, the printing, publishing, and paper industries were especially hit hard each losing 10 percent or more of their employees from 2008 to 2009. Japs Olson, a direct mail printing company, had to lay off nearly 300 employees between 2006 and 2010, 30 percent of its workforce. The United States Postal Service workforce declined only 15 percent during the same period, even as mail volume fell by 20 percent. Even as the use of Internet and new media increases, direct mail rem remains an effective tool for communicating with consumers at all levels. Combining direct mail with the Internet has proven to be more effective than using either in isolation. As a result, businesses across America, large and small, are increasingly working mail-based advertising into their market ca marketing campaigns. When mailers pay postage, that postage should be used to manage the Postal Service. Unfortunately, the Postal Service has been unable to adapt itself quickly to a world where electronic communication is rapidly replacing physical mail. This failure of adaptation has left the Postal Service with severe excess capacity and burdensome labor costs and put it on a trajectory that will lead to fiscal insolvency by October 2011. The looming fiscal crisis of the Postal Service can no longer be ignored. Congress must work with businesses, unions, and Postal Service itself to reform the Postal Service's business model and achieve long-term sustainability. In short, together we must all work together and right-size the postal system for the 21st century. However, before we can discuss the details of reform, I believe it is important to, take, to make sure that we understand the challenges that the mailing industry has faced and continues to face today. That is why we are here today. With that in mind, I thank the witnesses for appearing, and I look forward to their testimony. I now recognize the distinguished uh, member from Massachusetts and the ranking member, Mr. Lynch, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the courtesy. And I also want to thank our witnesses for their testimony. Today, the subcommittee will examine recent developments in the mailing industry and, in particular, the economic and business challenges faced by large volume mailers, supply companies, and mail houses. Given that the Postal Service has just released its second quarterly financial reports for fiscal year 2011, and the news is not good, 
It is my hope that this hearing will also provide us with an opportunity to further discuss the immediate steps that we can take in order to restore the Postal Service to financial solvency for the benefit of the entire postal community and for the country. This week, the Postal Service reported that despite significant cost reductions and revenue generating efforts, it ended the second quarter of fiscal year 2011 with a net loss of $2.2 billion. That compares with a net loss of $1.6 billion during the same period, uh, the same reporting period last year. So, in addition, the Postal Service witnessed continued decreases in total mail volume, which dropped from 42.3 billion pieces to 41 billion pieces. Uh, a drop in mail, mailing service revenues, which declined by $568 million, and uh, a loss in total operating revenue, which fell by $500 million. Accordingly, the Postal Service projects that it will have reached the statutory debt limit of $15 billion by the end of the current fiscal year. And absent legislative change, the Postal Service will be forced to default on its mandatory payments to the Federal Government, including a $5.5 billion retiree health benefit fund payment that is due on September 30th of this year. It is against this extraordinary financial backdrop that we must examine recent trends in the mailing industry. After all, the Postal Service is an industry cornerstone and its financial recovery is vital to addressing many of the challenges faced by other postal stakeholders, including mailers, print companies, uh, paper businesses and uh, general corporations uh, across the United States. For the sake of the Postal Service long-term financial viability, I understand that we must give due attention to various modernization and restructuring proposals in order to ensure that the Postal Service is able to transition and, and grow in the digital age. When it comes to addressing the Postal Service's current financial situation, I believe we have reached the breaking point and we can no longer kick the can down the road. Importantly, there are certainly actions that we can take in the short term that will point the Postal Service down the right financial path. For example, we can revisit the legally mandated requirement that the Postal Service pre-fund 75 years of future retiree health benefits with annual payments of $5.5 billion. Such a requirement is unheard of in the private sector and is not faced by any other public enterprise. In addition, we can work to reduce the Postal Service's pension costs by addressing the significant overpayment of both its civil service retirement system and Federal employee retirement system liabilities. To this end, I have introduced legislation, H.R. 1351, that will rectify the billions of dollars in overpayments that the Postal Service has made into its civil service retirement system account. Moreover, this legislation would allow the Postal Service to use its Federal employees' retirement system surplus to cover the projected cash shortfall that will result when its next retiree health benefits payment comes due in the fall. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to our witnesses' perspectives on these issues, as well as the significant challenges that are being faced by the mailing industry generally. I thank you for holding today's hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Um, members have a, seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We will now welcome our panel of witnesses. Uh, Mr. Dave Reby is President of Logistics and Distribution for Quad Graphics. Mr. Jerry Sarasal, Sarasal um, is Senior Vice President, Government Affairs for the Direct Marketing Association. Mr. Rob Melton is Vice President of Specialty Paper for Domtar. Is that correct? Okay. And Mr. Todd Haycock is Director of Postal Services for Infotech North America. I welcome you all, and pursuant to our committee rules, uh, all witnesses must be sworn in. So if you would please stand and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, thank you, and please be seated. Uh, what we are going to do is ask that you give a brief, less than five-minute summary of your test written testimony that has been presented to the, um, to the committee. And after that, then we will go into questions. And, and uh, now I will recognize uh, Mr. Reby for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for providing me with this opportunity to testify on behalf of Quad Graphics. 
My name is Dave Reby and I am President of Logistics Services for Quad Graphics, the largest printer and mailer of magazines and catalogs in the United States. We also print and mail many other types of products. The majority of Quad Graphics' 142 facilities are located in the United States. On an annual basis, we partner with the Postal Service to process 16 billion pieces of mail that account for $4 billion in postage. Economic activity and advertising spending are key drivers of the demand for printing. The global economic recession has caused a fall off in printing since 2007. Along with postage increases and alternative marketing technologies, many printing companies have failed and the industry is going under, going un, undergoing consolidation over capacity. My company is not immune to the continued impact of the recession. We have had to make job reductions, plant closures, and complete other restructuring actions. Quad Graphics is encouraged by the cost reduction realized by the Postal Service during the last 10 years, but it has not been enough to offset the decrease in mail. The Postal Service currently maintains a network that was built to support 300 billion pieces of mail annually. Total mail volume in 2011 will be closer to 170 billion. Its network needs to be right-sized, despite resistance from local communities and their U.S. Congressional representatives. To survive and better serve its customers, the Postal Service must be allowed to close and consolidate processing facilities and post offices and right-size its payroll. Quad Graphics fully supports the Postal Service in that process. Congress has an opportunity to help the Postal Service resolve its financial shortfall by returning to the Postal Service the more than $50 billion that have been overfunded for the Civil Service Retirement System. This money belongs to the ratepayers since nearly all revenues of the Postal Service come from postage, of which 90 percent comes from businesses. Additionally, legislative changes are needed to modify or eliminate the mandated $5.5 billion annual payment to retiree health care. We recommend that the retirement system's overpayment should be transferred from the pension fund to the retiree health benefits fund to fully prefund those obligations. Quad Graphics encourages Congress to act in this manner. The Postal Service must also grow mail volume and revenue. It can do this by offering incentives to mailers. For years, we have said the Post Office needs to be more businesslike. We have asked the Postal Service to be more creative in its pricing strategy and to use rightful pricing flexibility. In 2011, we are seeing a different approach by the Postal Service to incentives that are based on value-added products and services and partnerships with mailers. Quad Graphics fully supports these efforts. My company believes that print is a key element in effective marketing campaigns that use multiple forms of media. More than half of marketers are successfully utilizing three or more types of media, including print, in their marketing campaigns, according to a 2010 study. Quad Graphics intends to keep print relevant and cost effective as an important way for U.S. companies to conduct business. We are helping our U.S. customers reduce their postal costs through investments in our innovative distribution network. In conclusion, if the Postal Service can manage its costs and maintain an acceptable pricing structure, its business can be maintained and growth will be realized in certain classes of mail. Quad Graphics will continue to do everything it can to help the Postal Service be successful. We encourage Congress to do the same. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the subcommittee, for allowing me the opportunity to share with you information about Quad Graphics and the role we play in the mailing industry. I would ha be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Reby. Uh, Mr. Searsall, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chairman Ross and members of the subcommittee. I'm Jerry Searsall. I'm the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs for the Direct Marketing Association, and we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Direct Marketing Association is a trade association for marketers and nonprofits to com use communication channels to reach customers and potential donors directly. Uh, our members represent about 70 to 80 percent of all the mail in the United States Postal Service and about 85 percent of Postal Service revenues. Uh, as you said, Mr. Chairman, the uh, Envelope Manufacturers Association has found that uh, mail has an economic impact of $1.1 trillion employing 8.4 million Americans. It is a very important channel of communication for our members. Uh, marketers have always had to adopt to technology changes to survive, 
and so much the Postal Service. And the Postal Service has done so in the past. You go from horse-drawn carriages to Pony Express to uh, the rail to the auto to the air and hopefully now to uh, electronic. Um, the technology really affects direct marketers and our, our members in four distinct ways. Uh, internally, what happens at the Pulse Service, internally in their own operations, uh, customer preferences, and um, disposal of the mail as an important uh, factor with technology. And the Pulse Service has automation and it has improved productivity. Uh, some of the productivity gains. Some of the, the help has been lost, however, with requirements that are placed on mailers for preparation and, and, and IT requirements that increase costs are exactly like a postage increase. And so some of that has been lost. And we really hope that internally the Postal Service can do more with electronic means to uh, accept the mail and take postage to try and reduce paperwork there and, and make some savings. For mailers, the new electronic communications really opens up a new avenue to reach uh, customers and donors. But it is also an avenue that where we can complement, uh, use it to complement the mail. Uh, new print technologies using uh, new uh, allow multiple pieces of mail in one print run. So we can take advantage of pre-sort and also different demographic uh, considerations for, for the recipients. Uh, we can complement electronic shopping. Something goes in a shopping cart, it's removed from a shopping cart. You can print a postcard or a catalog with that item that was removed from the shopping cart and send it to them and in increase sales with a new offer. Uh, members are using electronic messages to say, hey, take a look. Look out for this catalog. It is coming in the mail tomorrow. And that is uh, an important thing. Mail is used to drive traffic to websites. Uh, our catalog members don't have to be told when the catalog reaches the home. They just take a look at traffic on their website because it is a driver to, to websites. There are companies out there that will find out f what my preference is for receiving uh, communications. And a marketer can go to them and they will send e to me an electronic message, to Dave a mail message, so that it can all be done at once. These kinds of compliments, uh, complementary activities of electronic and print uh, are there and we hope it is being used. And it all depends on the return on investment. For the return on investment for, for the advertising dollar, wherever it is greater, that is where the marketers are going to go. On the environmental side, it is interesting. You want to improve the value of the mail and the idea of the, the, the thoughts of the importance of mail to consumers. And by techn technological improvements in paper and so forth, uh, you reduce the economic imp imprint, I mean, the environmental imprint, excuse me. But you also have increased recycling, and we are working to try and get more and more mail recycled. The EPA said 64 percent of uh, standard mail was recycled in 2009. We want that to, to, to increase, so it increases the value of the mail in the minds of the American consumers. There is a consumer preference. Clearly, uh, they like bill pays, and that saves marketers money. That first class mail is going to go. There are incentives to have me receive the mail, the, the bill, electronically. That saves marketers money and it meets consumer preferences. That mail is going to be gone. But banks have found electronic customers, they retain them more if they send them a piece of mail. I know my time is just about up. Uh, but, and we need postal delivery. We do applaud the Postal Service for looking for a summer sale which for mail pieces have a QR code to try and complement mobile communications with print. It all comes down to the return on investment and postage. You have got to figure out the retirement and the, and the health issue. And the Postal Service has to downsize, however. We have to have that straight. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Sarasali. Uh, Mr. Melton, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Rob Melton and I am Vice President of Converting Papers for Domtar. Domtar is the number one producer of printing and writing papers in North America and we employ 8,500 
people across the U.S. and Canada. I very much appreciate the opportunity to, prefer, to appear before you this morning to provide a paper manufacturer's perspective on the Postal Service and the mail supply chain. As Chairman Ross and others have mentioned this morning, <clears throat> the Postal Service is the engine that drives the $1.1 trillion mailing industry and provides 8.3 million jobs. As you know, the Postal Service is on the brink of insolvency. Through our active membership uh, with the EMA and uh, customer relationships, we clearly understand the devastating impact of, on the mail industry if the Postal Service issues are not resolved. Regulatory and legislative decisions that result in changes to the reliability, level of service, and cost to deliver mail all influence our customers how our customers choose paper as their communication medium over other technology options. With approximately 30 percent of printing papers produced by our industry traveling through the mail stream, these choices have a dramatic impact on our bottom line. Uncertainty about the viability of the Postal Service will negatively impact mailer and marketer decisions to choose mail, so the urgency to restore confidence that the Postal Service is a dependable partner is great. Our industry has been forced to respond to economic challenges. The paper industry has faced very similar challenges to the Postal Service. Structural, and, structural decline in paper consumption since 2004 has averaged 4 percent per year. Part of this is due to the cyclical uh, nature of our business and the economy, but primarily due to the changes in the way people communicate and conduct business. This has left us with excess capacity and a cost structure that cannot be supported by current or expected demand. We have focused on cost, including making difficult decisions to close higher cost machines and facilities in order to be more efficient and to maintain critical balance between supply and demand. Since 2007, Domtar has closed machines in Maine, Ontario, Wisconsin, and North Carolina. In fact, a few weeks ago, we announced yet another pending closure of a machine in Arkansas. This is one of four machines that exist in the facilities and will have a negative impact on 110 people. These are real jobs in rural America with wages and benefits in the six figures, jobs that are not easily replaced. To put in context, U.S. paper and paperboard has declined 10 percent over the past three years. Fifty-two paper mills have been closed. Paper industry workforce has been reduced by 31 percent, losing nearly 400,000 jobs. However, we have not just focused on cutting costs. We have focused on meeting the evolving needs of our customers to try to mitigate the trend of structural demand decline. Examples of this include uh, developing products for new print technologies that will allow marketers to uh, digitally print images to be more customized uh, and variable to, to uh, drive response rates and improve their returns. We also are reducing um, overall paper consumption by making lighter weight papers that have similar attributes to current products that uh, allow mailing costs to go down but yet uh, deliver uh, the same uh, results. One fact that I think uh, is, uh, needs to be known is that we are fighting back. We are we're making sure that uh, consumers and perception of the paper-based communications uh, are well known. Uh, Sixty-three percent of all paper produced in our industry is recovered. That includes uh, paper that is produced that goes into archival uh, applications such as books or, or archives, uh, but also um, toilet um, and towel and tissue, so they are not recoverable. We have also introduced a, uh, a paper campaign, Domtar has, that heavily um, raises awareness of the intrinsic value and sustainable nature of paper through our Paper Because campaign. We have a website, paperbecause.com, which has a great deal of information about this, and I encourage you to check it out. One example of where Paper Because campaign is focusing is on raising awareness of consumers of some misguided attempts to convert paper-based mail recipients to electronic transactions, often without choice. Recent polling data by Wilson Research found that 66 percent of Americans preferred receiving paper bills and statements, while only 13 percent preferred electronic delivery. Yet institutions are increasingly, increasingly switching customers to electronic statements without choice and in many cases are charging for paper statements to manage their accounts. For example, the Social Security Administration is no longer mailing annual statements. While we appreciate this, the uh, cost savings, this is not without risk. We don't dispute that some customers prefer electronic statements, but consumers should have a choice and shouldn't be penalized for preparing paper-based statements. 
the short term decisions that are acted upon to save the Postal Service and to control costs and deal with statutory flawed pension and triary health care obligation funding rules will underestimate the impact on mail volume and may accelerate volume decline further. The paper industry has been forced to make difficult decisions. We have the ability to adapt, to change our cost structure, to anticipate customer needs and set about a task to resolve them. The Postal Service should do the same. Failure is not an option, as we have many industries and so many jobs depend on the well-functioning, uh, reliable Postal Service. Thank you for your time. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Melton. Mr. Haycock, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. My name is Todd Haycock, and I am the Director of Postal Services for 3i Infotech North America. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about the changes that I have seen over the past few years in this industry and what I expect to see in the future. As the Nation's largest outsourced remittance processing provider and one of the largest first-class mailers in the industry, mailing approximately half a billion mail pieces annually, the U.S. Postal Service is one of our largest customers, our partners. It wasn't that long ago that the U.S. Postal Service was the only choice for sending and receiving bills, invoices, statements, and other transactional documents. However, this shift away from physical mail delivery to other forms of bill presentment and payment has increased pace in recent years as the number of alternative consumer billing and payment options has grown. You may be familiar with online bill presentment and payment, but other channels are emerging, such as secure email billing and payment, electronic mailboxes tied to physical street addresses, uh, mobile presentment and payment, text-based billing and payment, and more. The shift to alternative channels is coming at the detriment of the U.S. Postal Service handled remittance mail, and the decline in postal remittance mail has caused 3i Infotech to close processing facilities in Tampa, Florida, Baltimore, Maryland, and Des Moines, Iowa. At the same time, other remittance processors have decided to exit the business entirely to focus on their core financial services. We have, a, we have acquired and consolidated both J.P. Morgan Chase's and First Tennessee Bank's remittance processing operations. I anticipate that other consolidations will continue to occur in the industry as providers find they can't maintain the scale or efficiencies necessary to remain profitable. When paired with tend, trend directions and analyst predictions, this continuing shift indicates that postal mail is changing from being the dominant channel for bill and payment delivery to being one of many channels available. Print bills and remittance, paper remittance exist alongside all the other electronic channels, with all measuring relatively equal levels of importance to the biller. At 3i Infotech, we follow these trends very closely and therefore uh, focus on providing new and expanded products and services to serve the changing billing and payment market. There are two sides to the equation, the bill and the payment. I see this change and how payments are being made as being driven by the consumer. The ease of making payments on a computer or on a mobile device where a few clicks can complete the transaction is very appealing to um, appealing option to time-pressed consumers. On the other hand, the presentment of these documents has not been subject to as fast of a shift away from the U.S. Postal Service to electronic bill delivery. I believe this is mainly because the shift is being driven by the is not being driven by the consumer, but by businesses. I personally prefer to receive paper statement and then go online to make my payment, as do many individuals that I know. For businesses, however, there is good reason for trying to drive consumers to electronic presentment. The bis biggest concern is the cost, with postage rates increasing and the demand on large mailers to make expensive changes to the mailing process in order to meet changing postal requirements. Businesses have to make hard choices as to where to assign their resources and capital. I am seeing more of my business customers pushing hard to drive consumers away from paper. As an example, one of my customers is currently planning on charging consumers $1.50 per month if they wish to continue to receive paper statements, and they are in the process of informing customers of this pending change. But this organiz organization is not alone in pushing for electronic adoption. As an example, between 2008 and 2009, one of our customers saw a 5.5 percent increase in the number of monthly statements being presented electronically. 
In 2010, it grew to an 8.3 percent increase. This, this means that electronic presentment represents 11.3 percent of their total volume and will probably grow even more in 2011. On the other hand, um, well, one of my other customers introduced electronic presentment and payment in July of 2008, and now in March 2011, they have 147,328 consumers receiving electronic statements every month. That represents 16 percent of their total volume. Every study and analyst group predicts that the volume of paper bills mailed to the U.S. Postal Service will continue to decline in coming years in favor of electronic alter alternatives. But the rate at which that decline occurs is dependent on what actions the U.S. Postal Service takes over the next couple of years. The ball is already rolling and reversing the current trend will be difficult. However, I think if the U.S. Postal Service focuses on what the mailers in the industry need, the value the mail can provide, and decreasing the complexity and costs of the mailing process, businesses will divert their capital and resources to more pressing projects instead of trying to move away from physical mail in an effort to cut costs. The U.S. Postal Service faces substantial changes, both financially and structurally, that need to be addressed directly. However, I have observed that the new U.S. Postal Service management team is willing to address these issues and increase their focus on mailers. This is very encouraging and I feel will be key in keeping the U.S. Postal Service as an indispensable medium of commerce and communications. Thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Haycock. We will now move into the uh, uh, series of questions and I will uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Um, it is interesting because as we, we talk about the Postal Service and, and I equate it to, to the, uh, the, the original information highway. Uh, that over the last 200 years has provided by way of infrastructure uh, the, the flow of information to households and the businesses everywhere. And yet over the last 20 years, predominantly with the use of the Internet, we have seen times change, but I don't think we have seen the Postal Service adapt to the market trends that have happened as a result of additional information uh, highways that have been developed out there. My, my first question would go to those that are in the, in the, in the manufacturing and, uh, arena, or not manufacturing, but in the, um, uh, the, the mailing arena. Mr. Reby, uh, what percent can you say of your total cost is labor cost of your business? Uh, I, I actually don't know that right off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sasali, any of your members, do you have any idea in, in your association what percent of total uh, labor cost is of the total cost? Um, <clears throat> we, I don't. I know that some of other delivery uh, uh, companies, the labor cost is about 50 percent of their total cost. Okay. And Mr. Melton, can you state? About one third. About one third. So about 33 percent is, yes. is, is labor costs. Yes. Mr. Haycock? I am not exactly sure, but I'm, I know it is less than 50 percent of okay. our costs. And, and what we have seen in the testimony here today, I mean, we have seen uh, the United States Postal Service post $2.2 billion loss for the last quarter, $2.6 billion loss for the, for the, for the year to date. Um, 80 percent of their cost is labor costs. It almost makes it cost prohibitive to do business unless some significant systemic changes are made. Your businesses have had to make those changes. Could you describe, Mr. Reby, some of the changes that you have had to make? Uh, did it include layoffs? Did it include you know, a product, a product reformation and, and, and marketing changes or things of that nature? Yes, thank you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, when when uh, when we hit the recession, uh, we we were in a, we're actually in an industry that just had too much capacity, which is similar to other industries, <laughs> and uh, we've uh, put a big focus on looking at automation, which actually reduces labor cost, and focusing on on uh, taking out equipment that is not efficient. And, uh, and we have seen a reduction in the overall uh, capacity that we have, whereas um, in, in some plants we were running at 50 percent capacity. Today, through consolidation, we were able to raise up the plants that weren't shut down to a capacity rate of 85 to 90 percent, which is much more economically efficient. Thank you. Mr. Melton? I know you mentioned, and I think that you've had that you've had to undergo some changes, yeah, furloughs, and we've uh, we've we've uh, in the last few years we've we've laid off a significant amount of people uh, as a result of of having excess capacity and machine and facility closures. 
uh, probably in the neighborhood of uh, 3,000 people, two, 3,000 people. Oh. Mr. Haycock? Uh, on our manufacturing side, where we produce the invoices and statements, we have continued to uh, increase our productivity and thus having to lay off uh, you know, employees as we, as we increase the productivity using automation and, and equipment to, to do that. Um, on the remittance side, we have also um, closed uh, facilities and consolidated because that volume has, has dropped dramatically. And so, uh, uh, Mr. Sosali, go ahead. Uh, we have seen studies show that during the, re the recession we had a, a reduction within the mail mailing industry of about 25 percent uh, for employees. And what you have done, I, I, I guess, is to adapt to a market change in order to stay solvent. And my question to each one of you with my last minute here is, do you think that the Postal Service is doing enough to reduce their costs to avoid insolvency? Mr. Reavy? I, I don't, but I think they are being restricted by some outside influences as well. What would those be? Well, I think the ability to be able to right-size their facilities, uh, there, there are definitely facilities out there that are not supporting themselves and don't make good business sense, uh, but there is lobbying to keep them open anyway. I understand. Mr. Sassali? Uh, we think they, we can't afford the excess capacity. They should be moving much more rapidly and reducing the excess capacity of Pulse Service. Okay. Mr. Melton? Agreed. It is uh, it's not going to get any better, and you need to make tough decisions now to be viable for the future. And that includes consolidation? Yes. Okay. Mr. Haycock? It is interesting to me that uh, years ago the cost of manufacturing the statements to present them for our customers and the cost of postage were very similar. And now, now the, the differential there is much bigger. We have reduced the cost for manufacturing, but the postal costs have just con continued to go up which brings attention to those costs that businesses want to then you know, stop mailing. Thank you. I see my time is up. I now recognize the ranking member from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for questions. Five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Reby, uh, I agreed with a lot of your, your testimony. We will get to that part. Uh, I am just concerned. Are you uh, aware of the labor contract recently ratified by the American Postal Workers Union? I am aware of it. Okay. Uh, the agreement, as you know, will reduce postal service labor costs by instituting a two-year two pay freeze. It introduces a new career pay schedule that is below the existing schedule, and it substantially increases the use of non-career employees. Overall, this will result in over $3 billion in savings over the term of the agreement, and the Postal Service is looking forward to executing similar agreements with the other uh, postal unions uh, going forward. Uh, would you agree that 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 is a significant uh, uh, cost saving that will result from this contract? I would say it is a step in the right direction. Whether or not significant is the word I would use based on their overall labor, labor cost, I don't know if I could get there. I mean, you do agree that sorting mail, you know, 40 billion pieces of mail, uh, handling those packages, and actually physically delivering the mail is a, is a labor-intensive process. I don't know how you get away from that. If you are going to actually take the mail and deliver it to every home and business in America, that, that's labor-intensive. We don't have robots that can do that. Uh, so, you know, it's a labor-intensive business. I, I just don't see how, how you get away from that. Uh, let, let's go to something that we agree on. Uh, we have been in a, in a debate over the overpayment made by the United States Postal Service uh, for employee service that was outside of the uh, U United States Postal Service. This is for employees who were under the Federal system. And uh, I agree. I agree with your, your testimony that the overpayments have been uh, made and they have been funded by postal customers. Uh, I also believe that the United States Postal S Service employees uh, the postal clerks, the letter carriers, both rural and urban, uh, my mail handlers, uh, the supervisors, and, and, and postmasters, they have earned those, those pension credits. So they have been shortchanged because what they are working for uh, is being siphoned over to a Federal system. Uh, so we are actually have a system right now under this current formula that the United States Postal Service, its customers and employees are subsidizing the Federal system. Now, we have had a debate about this in committee and, and with uh, the representatives on the Federal Government side, and they are saying that you are aware of this, that this was the plan all along, 
and that you all understood that you were going to be overcharged to pay for Federal employees who don't work for you. That is the response I am getting from the Federal side. And I just want to, I am just curious, were you told at the beginning that, that your operations are going to subsidize employees who don't work uh, for the Postal Service that, who, who is, you know, this is the relationship you have? Were you told that, Mr. Reby? Not to the best of my knowledge. Uh, Mr. Sarasali? No, and I wasn't around. I might look it, but I wasn't around in 72 uh, do, doing that. Uh, so I am not sure what was told back then. I think you were around in 72. I, just I was know. around, but not, not in the post there. Yeah, yes. all right. <laughs> I was going to say, you must have had a rough life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Melton? Well, I can say. I am no spring chicken either, sir. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, nothing taken. Thank you. Well, I can say I wasn't around in 1972, but I, I don't believe that that would be the case. All right, Mr. Haycock, I'm agreeing. I don't believe that was the case. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't get this. That's the argument that they're making. That that uh, the 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 unions here, the the uh, mailing houses, that they're that the formula is the formula, and that you were all part of this. That uh, that you're going to subsidize the the pensions. For, for folks that don't work for you or aren't in this business relationship in the current configuration. And I just scratch my head on how they came up with that. They cannot argue that the, that the formula doesn't favor uh, the Federal Government and, and put a greater burden on you. So they are arguing that this was the deal. And, I, I, you know, I would just say if I was sitting in your, your, in your chair, I would be thinking about a lawsuit saying, wait a minute. You can't take our revenues and, and, and pay the pensions of, focus of folks that we don't have a relationship with, that aren't servicing our businesses. And I don't know if your, your association has ever thought about that, but uh, I'd say now is the time to start thinking about it. I really do, because I agree with you. I also agree on the consolidation of postal uh, services. I'm, I'm running out of time here. But um, I, we, we have asked, and it's not outside pressure, I don't believe, that is, that is fighting against these closures. I think it's is institutional resistance. Uh, we have 38,000 post offices in America today. Uh, you know, we spend, uh, we have been spending out on the, on the floor here an inordinate amount of time naming additional post offices. I think we're going to run out of names before we run out of post offices, to be honest with you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I agree that, you know, we have a lot of post offices out there that are close together, and, and we could do a better job at consolidating and closing some of those that have that have several close together clustered where it would just be a matter of walking up the street and using the other post office, especially in some of our densely populated urban areas. So I am with you on that, but uh, uh, I have run out of time. So uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lynch. And I now recognize the uh, Vice Chair of the Subcommittee uh, from Michigan, Mr. Amash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Reby, you mentioned that the total mail volume for the for the Postal Service is uh, 170 uh, billion pieces, and uh, yet the infrastructure is built to support 300 billion pieces. Uh, due to technology <coughs> and electronic diversion, and given that mail volume has declined steady, steadily for the past four years, is it, is it safe to say that the Postal Service is wasting money to keep these systems operating? Uh, in some ways, they are required to keep some of these systems running. Uh, and and the, the, so yeah, I, absolutely, I, I would say that. Would it be sustainable for your uh, company to have twice the production capacity that you actually needed and to uh, spend money that you don't have on equipment that is hardly being used? Absolutely not. And uh, I would ask the same question of, of the other uh, witnesses here. There is excess capacity that should be removed, and we would not, we can't afford to maintain that excess capacity. And our, my members uh, wouldn't survive if they maintained that excess capacity within their operations. We are in that exact same position, and we have closed facilities to match uh, demand. Mm -hmm. In our manufacturing, um, similar thing. We, we we try to maximize the equipment we have and not have um, excess capacity, just to keep our uh, you know our efficiencies and our um, our costs down. And uh, I assume each of you would also give the recommendation to the Postal Service that we need to uh, reduce excess capacity. Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Reby, you talked about uh, pre-funding health care uh, with a pension fund. Could you talk about that a little more? Well, I think the belief is is just to tr try to create an, an economic environment for the post office that makes them stronger. Uh, we continue. We just saw the quarterly results uh, yesterday, and uh, trying to find a way to use that funding to give them a, a stronger foundation is kind of the theory behind it. In, in Mr. Reby, in your company, you also print stuff that is not mailed. Am I right? Correct. And what what percentage of your business would that be? Uh, I would say twenty to twenty percent. Has that changed over the past few years? Yes. It's it's gone up or down? Well, it's it's gone up because we did a major acquisition <laughs> about a year ago. So that that brought some product lines into our business that weren't mailed directly. Okay, Mr. Uh, Saraselli, what's the level of coordination between uh, direct marketers and the postal service? Uh, I guess what I'm asking is, uh, do they have um, personnel at, at direct marketing facilities, uh, you know, what's what's generally the the scheme uh, for our for our large the, the larger members? They they have a fairly uh, significant uh, relationship with the post service, with uh, particularly at the plant level. There are some some of my, our members actually have postal operations within the plant, detached uh, ma mail units, are there, so postal employees are there to accept the mail in the plant. Now, some of our smaller members work with customer service representatives they, uh, and work through us, through the association. We have a fairly uh, consistent dialogue with uh, headquarters, not down in, in the field level here, but with headquarters of postal service. To try to try and work work with them, so that there are sales for they have a relationship with sales forces. Many of them use suppliers like printers such as Quad, who print the mail for them for many members and then enter it in the mail stream. And they have relationships with the postal service. Are there any alternatives uh, that direct marketers use besides the postal service? Oh, absolutely. They're multi-channel. I mean, you use uh, electronic. They use telephone. They use direct response TV and radio, uh, br even broadcast kind of ads. But the internet and and eventually moving to mobile. Uh, you have to use them all, or else you're going to fail. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Melton, do you have any uh, data to support your suggestion that using paper is actually more efficient than uh, communicating electronically? I think you had said that people prefer paper to. Uh, yes, uh, a study that would show that, uh, in terms of bill presentment, that people preferred a paper-based statement rather than an electronic statement. How much of your uh, paper volume is related to postal service? Uh, approximately forty percent. And when, when you said that um, sixty-three percent is recoverable, what mm -hmm. what does that mean exactly? Is it that it's recyclable? That it's that means that of the paper that's produced in North America, sixty-three percent of that is re recovered and brought back in to be produced into products that would be called recycled. So, so thirty-seven percent would come from trees, or y yes, yeah. that would be what we call virgin, <laughs> okay. which which would, but it's also renewable. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, my time expired. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amash. Uh, we're going to go around again uh, for, with a few more questions if uh, you all have time. Um, let's talk about the uh, electronic diversion and the Internet, because for so many businesses out there, the Internet has been a, a, a boost, uh, but for apparently the United States Postal Service. So what I would like you to do is, is to kind of put on a, a role of your postmaster for a day. And, and don't concern yourself with prefunding or, or retirement, okay? Let's concern ourselves with marketing ideas, innovation, and how we utilize uh, the new avenues of, of um, information age out there, the Internet, electronic diversion, to enhance the Postal Service. I know we have talked about consolidation. Mr. Sosali, in some of your uh, comments, your opening statements, you talked about how uh, the, using uh, digital media to, to physical media, I guess, is a way to put it. You know, uh, the Postal Service came up with just a couple years ago, if it, if it, if it fits, it ships uh, program. These are innovative ideas. These are entrepreneurial ideas. They come better from the marketplace than they do from government. And so what I would ask you to do, if you could, think about and, and explain to me or, or to this committee what you think could be done in, in conjunction with the uh, electronic media that is out there today to enhance the Postal Service 
because even if we do take care of the, the, the prefunding and the health care thing, we still have a systemic issue that we have to deal with with the Postal Service. And that systemic issue is how do we adapt them to the changes in the marketplace, to the changes in the information age, so that we don't have to be back here again as Congress trying to fix something that is antiquated. Mr. Reby? Yeah, just uh, I, part of it I, I brought up earlier. I think volume type discounts, getting creative with pricing, uh, incentivizing people to do more than what they are doing. From from my perspective, uh, the electronic media world is still trying to find itself. And for those of us that are on email or if you go on the web, we still view print as the most unintrusive way, print and mail as the most unintrusive way to solicit somebody to buy something for you. But complement it. I let, let people use the Internet as the vehicle to order. Now, that does have a negative impact on the post office, but the belief is, is that it's, it, when, you're on, when you're on the computer, and we all get them now, you get a lot more emails than you ever used to get. You don't know how you're getting them or why you're getting them. And, and it's intrusive to me. Where mail, uh, although people tried to make it seem intrusive, it's really not. It comes in your mailbox, and you have an opportunity to make a choice at that point. But but you don't have to deal with it when you're at work. You don't have to deal with it when you're trying to relax. You deal with it at your convenience. And I still think that's a huge opportunity for the post office to take advantage of the fact that it is unintrusive. Thank you, Mr. Sosali. Yeah. Well, I think the start. Uh, we have to look at mobile as well. And, and I think that this new summer sale they have with the QR codes is a great idea for the Pulse Service to look at. Uh, I do think that there are, uh, the Pulse Service should partner with the private sector there, with information we have. If, if, as I said before, if you know that I want to receive things electronically and that Dave wants to receive things in paper and uh, Smelton wants to receive things over the phone or, 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 or mobile, and they, you have that information, and to work with, with, uh, with marketers. So a marketer can go to one place and its message gets sent out to paper to me or paper to him, an uh, email to me on the web uh, uh, th through a mobile phone and have it go out. That is how you can complement communications. We have to look at this as a whole communications uh, uh, structure uh, and trying to reach uh, customers, donors, potential customers, potential donors, and, and try and find the preferences that the consumers want and get it out. That increases the ROI across the board. And I think the Pulse Service is part of that mix. It is going to be a changing part of the mix, and it is clearly going to change, change how the mail uh, is, is sent in, what is sent in. It may not be a catalog, it might be a postcard, it may be a smaller catalog, uh, different things. So that type of thing should be, I think, is happening today, can happen today, uh, provided Congress doesn't really hit privacy legislation that, that, that harms this kind of information. But that can happen now. That is where I would look Thank immediately. You. Thank you. Mr. Melton? I, I think. Um, the most unique thing about the U.S. Postal Service is that it has, uh, by mandate, the ability and uh, requirement to reach every household in the United States. And that is a very unique infrastructure that I don't think has been exploited properly. I agree. And some of that is uh, due to statute uh, of the types of services and, and products it can offer as not to compete with the private sector, I believe. But uh, as an example, you can walk into a post office and you can buy packaging and you can buy postage, but you can't buy the service to pack that package. Uh, you need to go to a, a private store for that. So those are the sorts of things I think that I would look to try to change. Uh, I also think uh, the ability to uh, time delivery of packages with the other channels that are there are a unique opportunity, and particularly with the technology that exists now to very targeted uh, make an offer to, to a, uh, a consumer. So, Thank you. Mr. Haycock, briefly. Uh, I agree with what has been said here. Um, I think as, as the Postal Service focus, focuses on what their core competency is and the value of the mail, as what has been said, maybe something along the lines of, um, you know, rather than paying uh, an extra charge for two ounces, um, include that in the um, overall price. So one ounce, two ounces is the same, is the same price. Um, so you can add more marketing and it reach those customers, as has been mentioned. Thank you. My time is up. Uh, Mr. Lynch, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> let me just, uh, you know, I, I agree with the Chairman's uh, 
suggestion that we need systemic change. There is no, no doubt about that. Uh, and that is notwithstanding the need for a reset on the health care payments and you know, a, a correction for the pension overpayment. But what, what those two items do, though, is, is buy us time because uh, you know, the pension overpayment is anywhere between $55 and $75 billion, and you know, the health benefit contribution here for retirees is, is $5.5 .5 billion per year. And so uh, if we look at the trend, and I, and I give the Postal Service some credit here, and I give the unions a, a lot of credit as well. Uh, if you look at what they have done since, 197, excuse me, since, since 2008, since 2008, the Postal Service has reduced its workforce by 120,000 people since 2008. They have cut 120,000 positions. Uh, and since 2009, it has reduced its total cost by $11 billion. Some of that is by automation, uh, and, but $4 billion is savings coming from reductions in labor costs. And if you add the $3 billion in savings that is going to come out of the American Postal Workers Union recent contract going forward for the term of that contract, you are talking about $7 billion in, in, in labor cost savings, and, and you are talking about $14 billion in, in, in reduction in cost. So they are making significant progress. And, and what I am saying is with the, with the correction to the pension overpayment uh, and the, the, uh, the uh, fast track uh, you know, health benefit uh, for retiree payments, uh, we, we, could make, we could make much more progress if we, we give ourselves more time. Now let me turn to a blatantly self-serving <coughs> question. Uh, each of you has briefly mentioned your concern for the financial condition of the Postal Service. And, you, again, you mentioned the, the retiree health benefit uh, payment of $5.5 billion and also the Postal Service uh, overfunding, which is anywhere between 50 and $75 billion. Uh, Last month, I introduced uh, H.R. 1351, the United States Postal Service Pension Obligation Recalculation and Restoration Act. This kind of rolls right off your tongue there. <laughs> the Act directs the Office of, OPM, Office of Personnel Management to update the actuarial methodology to be used in allocating the CSRS retirement benefits liabilities between the United States Postal Service and the Federal Government. So we are trying to reset that and, and correct it. Uh, any resulting surplus from this recalculation? if it is 55 or 50 or 75 billion, would then be transferred over to the Postal Service Retiree Health Benefit uh, Fund. And further, the Act would require that the Postal Service $7 billion refund would be refunded immediately and applied to the 2011 Retiree Health Benefit uh, Payment and Workers' Compensation Fund. Now, it is sort of what you were talking about to, to start this off, Mr. Reby. Uh, is, is that something that you think would get, the, get this Thing going in the right direction, get the Postal Service going in the right direction and, and uh, be, be helpful to you and your businesses? Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Sarasali? It would, and we support it. Thank you. Mr. Melton? No, thank you. Mr. Haycock? Yes, it would. Okay. Thank you. I told you it was self serving. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Look, uh, in, in all seriousness, I, I appreciate you know, you are in business. It takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there. You have been very helpful with the committee in, in uh, giving us your perspectives. I appreciate uh, greatly that you came here. You took the time to come here to testify before Congress to give us the perspective that you have and to you know, provide some more impetus for change uh, in, in this system that we all rely upon. So I appreciate you coming in there and helping the committee with its work. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. And I will recognize Mr. Uh, Amash for further questioning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Haycock, could you tell us a little more about your company? Sure. Um, we do. Um, we're the largest outsourced remittance processing provider. So all remittance statements, um, you send your coupon in with your check. We process those as well as do an electronic processing of payments. And then we also do the um, bill presentment. So we send out uh, bills in the mail stream. Uh, invoices, statements. We also provide other channels for our customers, uh, electronic channels as well. You said the, the Postal Service is one of your uh, biggest partners. What, uh, what other sorts of organizations are, would be big partners? Uh, s software um, providers that, that help us um, you know, do the operations uh, manufacturers, or excuse me, equipment manufacturers that um, provide us with uh, equipment to do our processing. 
One of the things I, uh, I found interesting, you said you were uh, encouraged by the new uh, Postal Service management team, but expenses this year are up uh, 100 million over the first six months. Uh, can you explain uh, why you're encouraged and, and what you think about that? I'm encouraged because um, what I'm seeing is a more customer focus. They are reaching out. Um, they seem to be uh, looking at new ideas, um, not trying to do business as usual, but looking at out-of-the-box um, items. I know there has been some discussions within the Postal Service about new options or new um, incentives and um, other ways of looking at um, adding value to the mail. So even though those, those haven't been implemented yet, um, I'm encouraged that they're looking at those items, looking at the mailers. So is it your belief that the expenses will uh, gradually go down as time goes on? Um, I don't, don't know if that's the case. Um, according to uh, USPS data, it appears that for the first time less than half of USPS's revenues will come from first class mail this fiscal year. Ten years from now, and this is a question to all of you, do you think first class mail will continue to be dominant, the dominant revenue source at the Postal Service? Mr. Reby. I do not. I agree. It will not be the dominant revenue source. It will not. Well, the current trends show that the case. Um, I think if we continue the same path, it will definitely not. I think there is an opportunity to, to change that, that trend by um, you know, accommodating the mailers that do first class mail and uh, adding that, using that value that the mail has could slow that trend anyway. Uh, and I, Again, this would be a question for all of you. Are, are, mailers, pre are mailers preparing for a post-first-class mail world? And uh, do you think that the Postal Service's current business model will work if first class declines from 78 billion pieces in 2010 to 46 billion pieces in 2020? I do not. I, I believe it has got to change. And do, you th and do you think mailers are prepared for this world? It depends how it changes. <laughs> Uh, they are they're prepared in the sense of looking at return on investment and they are going to use alternative means if it is if it's not there. We're, ma mailers are prepared, marketers are prepared to use the mail, which and the advertising mail is going to be dominant. The Post Service has to downsize to meet that new need that its marketers needs and they will remain a viable channel. Uh, for us, but they are prepared in the sense of they will go to alternative means if uh, the return is better elsewhere. It is not at the moment. That is why they are in the mail. The mail is still a good response vehicle, but uh, that will change if the Postal Service doesn't change on its own. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the standard mail side of it will continue to grow, and I think uh, the value of that has been proven, and and the returns are there, and it's it's uh, I think only going to improve as technology allows them to be more targeted. I also believe that on the on the statement presentment side that there's an opportunity for trans promotional advertising that goes along with the bill. Uh, you have a relationship with a customer already. The opportunity to to sell them more is there, and technology is allowing that. Um, in my business, that is what we do is first class mail. And um, I do see that, uh, that uh, shift away from first class mail happening. And for my business, we offer other alternatives, other channels, and, and op opportunity for our customers to choose which channels that they want to use. And we have to kind of go down that path in order for us to keep a, a viable business. Thank you. I am going to yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and um, I, I'd sort of like to pick up on where our, our colleague from uh, Michigan uh, left off. Um, you know, in and of itself, the decline in, in uh, first class mail doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, there were companies in 1900 who were making a lot of profit producing buggy whips. Uh, but if they didn't see the future, uh, they were in trouble. Uh, and uh, even though in 1900 it looked like a profitable business for quite some time to come, uh, the fact that we have a shifting market in and of itself doesn't, you know, the question is, can we create, as you suggest, a new business model? By the way, I have some legislation I hope you will look at that does just that, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, helps uh, take cognizance of the changes in the market. For example, uh, you know, companies like Amazon.com 
uh, have, have uh, become very profitable uh, with online sales. They have to, however, get those products to market. And the Postal Service, 1 percent now of its business is packages like that, but it is 2 percent of its profit, so the margin is pretty good. Mr. Melton, Mr. Haycock, do you think that there could be a future in expanding that kind of niche business for the Postal Service at some level of profitability? Absolutely. And I think there are opportunities to perhaps share uh, some, some routes, as an example. If, if we are going to reach every uh, household in, in the United States, um, you might as well take advantage of, of, of sharing some of those routes. If we are serious about making the Postal Service successful as we move forward in this century, uh, and I know my colleague Mr. Lynch has introduced legislation I certainly support and supported in the previous Congress in this whole prefunding issue, which is very substantial, and it is an onus on the Postal Service that is unique to the Postal Service. Congress does not require it of anyone else, and it is costing them billions of dollars every year. Uh, and so when we look at a figure that says you are losing $7 billion a year, but if we amortized, for example, the estimated overpayments and continuing 100 uh, percent requirement, uh, frankly, we could, we could probably substantially change that number uh, in a positive direction. But beyond that, that buys us some time, substantial amount of time, in which to figure out the business model. Mr. Melton, you mentioned something about why not let the Postal Service, uh, for example, uh, engage in packaging services. Is that correct? Yes. Are there other areas? Uh, anyone on the panel thinks that might be uh, something they would commend to the Postal Service as uh, a niche market for them or something they ought to get into? And, I, and, and before you answer, I, I point out Congress is part of the problem. The 2006 legislation, God knoweth why, prescribes the Postal Service from entering certain kinds of business. Given the situation we are in today, if we really mean what we say about caring about its fiscal plight, why wouldn't we uh, rescind those restrictions and let a thousand flowers bloom to see what works. Mr. Melton. Yeah, I agree. It is tough to run a business when you have uh, restrictions on controlling your costs and also limited in the, uh, meeting some market demands that may be there. So I, I would encourage that, uh, that those things are looked at. Hey, Mr. Haycock. The only concern I would have about um, opening everything up would be um, Losing focus on their their core, um, what they what they're best at. Um, now, I would agree that if there are um, other areas that could use that core business um, and and um, you know utilize what their their infrastructure, what they have today, then I I would be you know open definitely for sure. them to do that. But but can I just uh, engage you in that? Um, uh, you know, I've got a very large postal uh, office uh, in my district in Merrifield. It's sort of a regional post service. You know, people go there all the time for all kinds of things. Um, why not let them have a Starbucks outlet there so that people, when they go there to do their other core business, can also get a cup of coffee? You know, you're able to do that at the grocery store these days. You're also able to do banking at the grocery store, even though neither one of those are core missions of the grocery store. But by, in terms of convenience and making it a focal point in terms of retail activity, you at, enhance the viability of of the enterprise. Wouldn't that be some kind of model we ought to be looking at for the postal service? That seems very reasonable. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, anyone else in the panel? I got 30 seconds left. I think co-location, as you explained, is, is, is valuable. Uh, they can even try and locate it at another facility and have the post office there and open more times. You also have the ability to co-locate state uh, and, and local government things in a government facility there as well. So that's that's an area looking at the, the 38,000 at the moment, it could be less uh, postal facilities, you can uh, try and uh, enhance uh, that uh, uh, real estate footprint. Mr. Chairman, my time is up, but I, the, uh, uh, the gentleman uh, makes a very good point. I commend to the, my colleagues because as someone who ran a local government for a long time, uh, uh, historically a lot of post, uh, post offices have the stovepipe model. We are separate unto ourselves and sovereign and don't bother us. And a new model would suggest this kind of co-location with state and local services and government. There can be cost sharing. There can be huge efficiencies. And again, you are making that postal service, which are the post office, which already exists, a, a more focal point for the community. So, 
which, by the way, my legislation also addresses. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. I appreciate that input. I want to thank the panel members for being here today. We are grateful for your, for your input, and this subcommittee now stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.